without Laura Ballou here in her Apple phone, I uh, sometimes don't know what time to start, but uh, I've got a couple minutes after. So let's go ahead and prepare our hearts to uh, hear the word first in um, some silent meditation and uh, confession of sin. Um, then we will uh, begin a, um, a look today at uh, memorials and memory. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided the word to us. We thank you that you have provided your son for us and the provision uh, that um, Jesus has uh, for our eternal security, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us uh, to apply what you would have us to apply to our lives, that we might be missionaries in your divine mission, Lord, into this dark world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and um, happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, uh, if you were expecting uh, us to uh, continue on in Judges uh, today, you will, uh, you will uh, have uh, become disappointed uh, because we're going to take a, at least one week um, a deviation from that. Uh, but we will not be taking a deviation from the Word of God, nor will we be taking a deviation really from the Old Testament. Uh, but um, I hope you uh, have some nimble fingers uh, today, because this is going to be a little like a Bible drill. Uh, I, I have an expectation. What is it? Uh, draw swords. Um, so uh, limber up the dexterity. We'll be looking at quite a few things uh, but um, I, I did attempt to at least link uh, some of what we'll be looking today at, at memorials, a memorialization, and memory. And I can tell you that I have been in, and I think I may have mentioned this in a prior uh, uh, series, but I have been in every therapeutic area in pharmaceuticals except for ophthalmology which, as I mentioned before, is unfortunate because now I'm completely reliant on, uh, on corrective lenses to, to even be able to see, uh, see my Bible. But I've never been in ophthalmology. But um, there, has been one, there was one therapeutic area that was very difficult for me uh, to, to deal with, um, and that's when uh, I was uh, uh, responsible for a sales team uh, that marketed and still does market Aricep. Um, I don't know if you're familiar uh, with uh, what Aricept is um, indicated for, uh, but it is one of the few therapeutic options uh, that are indicated for the treatment of dementia and Alzheimer's. And that was, I think I consider myself at least above average when it comes to compartmentalization, okay? and being able to kind of set aside uh, some things and, and kind of wall them off. But I can tell you that was a therapeutic area that was exceptionally difficult for me to try to wall off. Uh, being in memory care centers, um, seeing um, uh, the anguish of, of loved ones, um, caregivers, um, was very, very difficult. Um, probably should ask to go ahead and turn, um, uh, turn the camera off, but I won't. Uh, it was about two months ago, I was actually approached about uh, would I be willing to come back to uh, uh, the memory loss, the Alzheimer's therapeutic area, because a company out there is doing some tremendous research uh, and is bringing in a couple of additional therapeutics. Um, folks, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself even to consider uh, going back into that. But I will tell you that the people who work in memory loss, in uh, dementia, in Alzheimer's, um, I mean, th those are angels among us. I can tell you that, in my, in my opinion. It is uh, so very difficult. So when I think of Memorial Day, I obviously know the origin of Memorial Day. Uh, the root of that is memory, okay, is remembering and so I completely know and understand the, the origin of Memorial Day and the celebration of Memorial Day uh, as it relates to uh, this particular 
uh, holiday that, that, that we observe. And if, if you have served, uh, if you have loved ones, neighbors who have served and have given uh, their lives uh, for uh, the uh, advance of freedom, for the uh, posterity of this country, uh, I thank you. Um, and obviously, we, we memorialize them uh, for the tremendous sacrifice. But memory is something that is really, um, uh, I think, uh, a, a, a tough concept. That doesn't stop, however, um, popular culture from attempting to at least delve into it. Um, one of my favorite movies actually comes from ni- in 1990. It's an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, okay? Um, prior governor of the state of, uh, yeah, see the fact that I actually relate Arnold Schwarzenegger to the prior governor of the state of California uh, will tell you a little bit about uh, how old I am, but um, the, the movie's called Total Recall. Does anybody remember seeing the movie Total Recall? Oh, we finally have found, I think, a critical mass of people who have seen a movie that, that, that I actually have enjoyed, so that, that's excellent. Um, well, if you remember the movie Total Recall, it's set in the uh, year 2084, which at that time seemed like an awfully long time away. Uh, but um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's character in that movie is just kind of an ordinary guy. He's just an ordinary guy, and he, um, he wants to experience what it would be like to, to live on Mars because Mars had uh, been colonized uh, by that point. But he wasn't going to be able to travel there, so he goes to a corporation called Recall. And Recall uh, is responsible for implanting false memories, okay, into people. And so the theory was he could go there and he could get false memories placed into his head so he could experience what it would have been like to have lived on Mars. Unfortunately, what he discovers is that his entire life has been a lie, and that everything that he has, even in his ordinary, what he thinks to be his ordinary life, is also implanted false memory, okay? So it begins to really mess with your mind as the viewer. But that's not the only movie that that has dealt with the concept of memory. Um, Another one of my favorites, and I feel very reasonably certain that we might only have one hand in this place that goes up, um, but it's, it's called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, okay? Yes, I see blank expressions except for my wife, who absolutely abhors that movie, uh, but um, uh, Jim Carrey and um, um, Kate Winslet uh, star in that movie, and uh, it, it, it is about uh, uh, memory. Now, I'm going to mention this one, and because of the, the main male character in this, my wife will be happy that I mention this one, but it's another movie that deals with memory, and that's the movie Vanilla Sky. Now she's, that's Tom Cruise, okay? So uh, uh, she, she's happy that I mentioned that one, um, but uh, lots of stuff going on with memory. And, and actually, I'm reading a series. I like Do- David Baldacci. Does anybody else read some David Baldacci out there? Okay, good. Anybody familiar with the character Amos Decker and the Amos Decker series? In fact, they call it the Memory Man series. Okay, he was a, um, should I do a spoiler alert here? I I don't know. Um, Actually, no. If you read the first series of of Amos Decker, uh, it'll tell you what, what the situation is. But he's a football player. Okay, I can't remember if he played for the University of Texas or Ohio, or Ohio State. I can't remember. But I know that in, in his first game as a, as a professional football player, after leaving college, he's on a kickoff a return unit and gets waylaid upside the head. Okay, And all of a sudden, he cannot forget anything. His memory is perfect. Okay, Even things that he wishes he could forget. He cannot forget. And the series goes, by the way, this makes him an awesome detective, okay? And that's kind of the thing, okay, as you go through the books and and whatnot. But um, memory is something that is really, really interesting. Uh, Really, really, I think it, you know, without being trite, it it does toy with the mind a little bit. What, 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 you know, how do we categorize it? How do we recall it? How do we bring it back up? 
So on this Memorial Day weekend, I thought we'd look at a few things, and um, we'll go through this thematically, hopefully fairly quickly, and like I say, hope you have nimble fingers. We're going to start in Exodus chapter 13, and I'll start to read as you're getting there. Good place to start in that chapter is verse 1. The Lord says to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. I want to stop there for just a second. We just finished up a lesson, a series of lessons on Samson. Remember, he, as his Nazarite vow, was consecrated prior to his birth. And now this is, this is you know, this is obviously significantly uh, before we get to the, 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 the period of Samson. But the Lord says to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open, among, open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast, is mine. Verse 3, then Moses said to the people, remember this day memorialize this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That's why there's memory. That's why it's to be memorialized. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today in the month of Abib you are going out. That's the first month. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which he swore to to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. A couple of words in here I want to to, to pull out. The word for sign is oath, O-W-T-H. And yes, that actually sounds exactly like the, uh, the English word we have for oath, to swear an oath. But it can be translated as many things. It can be a sign, a signal a beacon, a monument, an omen, a prodigy, evidence, a marker, a miracle, or a token. The word for memorial, in my translation says memorial between your eyes, is zikron, meaning a memorable thing, a reminder, a remembrance. So you could actually read verse 9 as, and this observance of the days of unleavened bread shall be something extraordinary for you to do to make a memorable impression on your mind so that the law of God can be written in your mind. So we see that there is a command to remember this day. The Israelites are given that command because they've been delivered out of Egypt, out of, safety, out of, uh, out of slavery. Okay? And it's not, it was not just to be a yearly ritual. This was a participatory type of memorial that they were to do corporately, cooperatively in their homes with their families for this purpose. Notice the purpose, not just memory, so that when your son asks you, why are you doing this? You can say, it's because the Lord has delivered me. It's a command given not only to the Israelites as a nation, it's a command that was given to the families of the Israelites to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A reminder that they were, you know, this is a part of the whole Passover situation, that they were delivered and their firstborn were consecrated. If the blood was not on the door, the angel would not pass over. We've seen in the book of Judges the importance of generations. What does the book of Judges tell us about the generations of the Israelites? The next generation did what? They did what was right in their own eyes because they forgot. They forgot what God had promised them and what God had commanded them and had left for the worship of idols. So in this this particular um, situation, Uh, uh, passage of scripture, I see a couple of things. Uh, One is that we have a responsibility to pass on these memorials to the next generation. It's Ronald Reagan 
who in one of his very famous speeches says freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like to be in the United States where men were free. That's what Ronald Reagan had to say. Now, I've heard actually and read some commentators talk about this being, making an application to the Word of God, that the Word of God is only one generation away from extinction. I summarily reject that. The Word of God is promised in the book of Isaiah to endure forever. God will not let his word be destroyed. It is not one generation away from extinction. It might be one generation away from that torch being passed to somebody else to carry it, but the word of God will not be extinguished. His redemptive plan His divine plan for mankind will go forward in his sovereignty, whether it's this country, who is so unbelievably generous in its missionary zeal in spreading it, whether it's this country or another entity, the word will continue to march forward. It will never go extinct. The grass may wither, the flower may fade, but the word of God will endure forever. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 17 just a couple over, and we're going to start in verse 8. At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and went up and fought against Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, but whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. Don't miss that part there, okay? Don't miss that part. Amalek prevailed. Amalek prevailed. That means Israelites lost their lives. That's what it means in war when your enemy prevails. There were martyrs made that day in this battle against Amalek. When Moses' hand grew weary and they took a stone and they put it under him, he sat down on it. Then Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. Look at this. The Lord then said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as a reminder, as a memorial, and recite it to Joshua. Don't just write it down. Talk about it. Spread that word. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Total recall. (laughs) Folks, that hadn't happened yet, okay? But it is going to happen. And what did Moses do? Moses built an altar and named it. He built an altar. He piled up stones, some of your translations may say, okay? in a a manner worthy of making a sacrifice. He built an altar, and what did he call it? The Lord is my banner. Now, this is where I could depart and talk a little bit about the importance of the flag, okay? But in Scripture, it says, what is our banner? The Lord is our banner. He said, indeed, my hand is lifted up toward the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to, to generation. And so it actually happened. Let's turn to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7 verse 15. 1 Samuel 7 chapter 15. Samuel judged Israel throughout his life. He is actually the last judge if you want to, if you want to, um, put it in the context of the the, the period of the judges, Samuel. Every year he would go on a circuit to Bethel, to Gilgal, and to Mitzpah, and would judge Israel at all these locations. Annually, Samuel would make a circuit, a circuit pastor, if you will, here. And one of the places he goes is to Gilgal. 
okay? What do we know about Gilgal? You. It's, the, it's the place where they crossed the Jordan into the promised land, okay? We're going to look at this, so turn over to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. Joshua 4. After the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, choose 12 men from the people, one man for each tribe, and command them, Take 12 stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the priests are standing. You remember what the priests are carrying? The Ark of the Covenant. You remember what happens to the Jordan when they go in? It stops. It stops. There's another crossing here, and they're they're at Gilgal. Carry them with you. Set them down at the place where you spend the night. Some of your translation, oh, it'll be here. So Joshua summoned the 12 men he had selected from the Israelites, one man for each tribe, and said to them, Go across to the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you lift up a stone onto your shoulder. Four, Joshua four, sorry, Joshua four. Yeah, starting one. Yeah, we're down to um, about, uh, about verse 6. So this will be a sign to you, a memorial, something to stimulate your memory. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean to you, you should tell them. The waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the Jordan's waters were cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a memorial for the Israelites, for God's provision of crossing the Jordan into the land which he had promised them. Verse 8, the Israelites did just as Joshua commanded them. Go figure that. (laughs) That would have been some great things to continue to do right there. The 12 men took the stones from the middle of the Jordan, one for each of the Israelite tribes, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the camp, and they set them down there. Do you get the picture? They take those stones out. They're heavy enough to have to be hoisted on their shoulders, and they take them into the camp of the Israelites where they have crossed, and they erect these stones there as a memorial. But don't forget verse 9, and actually some people try to use this to say that the Scripture is in error. It is not. This is a beautiful picture. Joshua also set up 12 stones, but where did he set them up? In the middle of the Jordan. These are two separate acts of memorial. These are two separate acts of worship here. He set them up in the middle of the Jordan where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. The stones are there to this day. The priests carrying the Ark continued to standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to tell the people. In keeping with all that, Moses had commanded Joshua. The people hurried across, and after everyone had finished crossing, the priests with the Ark of the Lord crossed in the sight of the people. The Reubenites, the Gadites, half the tribe of Manasseh went and battle formation. Don't forget that. They went in battle formation in front of the Israelites as Moses had instructed them. About 40,000 equipped for war, for war, crossed to the plains of Jericho in the Lord's presence. There's a couple of things I think to see here. One, you had a corporate memorial. You had a nationwide observance, a nationwide memorial. It is for posterity. It is for recognition and and remembrance from generation to generation about being delivered, about God's promise of bringing them into the promised land had been fulfilled. Now, don't get me wrong. The promised land is not a picture of heaven, okay? And the reason it's not a picture of heaven is why? They're girded up for war. We don't go to war in heaven, okay? Heaven is peace. But that, don't forget the, the situation that Joshua engaged in. Personal memorial, a very personal memorial in the middle of the Jordan. This was Joshua and Joshua alone. It's one thing to have 
corporate memorialization. It's one thing to have corporate worship. I wonder sometimes in my own personal life, do I have enough private, personal time spent in memory, in thinking about what the Lord has provided for me? Joshua's reverence here is about how we come to Christ, that our sins are dead and they are buried under the waters of the Jordan. For him, it's a personal decision. Nobody comes to Christ as a country, as a nation, under the flag of a country. You come to Christ individually by one decision, acceptance or rejection of his sacrifice. No nation, no corporate identity will ever be sufficient to secure your eternal conferred righteousness. It just doesn't happen. It's personal. Arno Gabeline, who was a 19th century Methodist minister, wrote this about this particular memorial. The 12 stones in the riverbed tell out the story of the death of Christ and our death with him. We are dead to sin as well as to the law and as well as crucified unto the world. We must therefore reckon ourselves dead to sin. The other memorial was erected at Gilgal. As they looked upon these stones and their children asked them, what mean these stones? They could point to them and say, as these stones were taken out of the Jordan on dry land, so they had been brought out of Jordan into this land of promise. This memorial is the type of the fact that we are alive unto God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There is more work to be done. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is the memorial which tells us that we are raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. These are two great truths to be seen in this double memorial that must ever be remembered by God's people. And then don't forget, we must be ready to fight because we are in this world and we are given the tools by which we gird up to fight. But we don't fight against flesh and blood, we fight in the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit against the principalities and the powers of the air. But there will come a day when we will not have to fight that fight, okay? Revelation 21, you don't have to turn there. It's a long way, long way that way, okay? You you might, and hopefully you'll remember this one from uh, when our pastor uh, spent some time in its beautiful picture. You remember those 12 stones? Well, listen to this. Revelation 21, chapter, or Revelation 21, 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the, held the seven bowls filled with the last seven plagues came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a very precious stone, like jasper stone, bright as crystal, The city had massive high walls with 12 gates. 12 angels were at the gates. The name of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. The city wall had 12 foundations. And the 12 names of the lambs, 12 apostles, were on those foundations. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city. Its gates and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, its width, its height are all equal. Then he measured out its wall, 144 cubits, 12 times 12. According to the human measurement, get that? The human measurement, not the metric system, okay? Cubits. That's the human measurement, which the angel, the angel used cubits, not the metric system. There's meaning there, I'm sure of it. The, the, the building material of its wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like glass. Then it talks about all of these jewels, okay? There were 12 of them, the 12th being amethyst. Verse 21, the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each gate was made with a single pearl. The broad streets of the city was pure gold like transparent glass, I did not see a sanctuary in it. What? You don't see a sanctuary in this new glorious city coming down? No, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its sanctuary. There is no need because you are with God. 
you are in his presence there. There will come a time when there will be no more need for war. Okay? There will be no more need to gird up okay, for war as the Gadites and the Benjamite, Benjaminites and, and the rest of them had to do. Let's turn over to 1 Samuel, and we're going to start in 1 Samuel num- uh, chapter 19. See, I saved you from having to go way over and come back. I want to set this up just a little bit for you. Um, I don't want to set up a whole bunch of it. We can probably just stipulate a few things here. Do you, do you know that Saul tried to kill David? Are we clear on that one? You, you remember the, the, the spear? <laughs> that was a clue, okay? Tried to kill David with a spear. Okay? Can we stipulate the fact that David and Jonathan were incredibly best buddies? Can we stipulate to the fact, and I think the pastor taught on this in, in their friendship, that Jonathan actually recognized that David would be king. And remember his pact to say, if my father is going to do you harm, I will let you know. I will be your warning. You remember that part? You remember? Okay, we can stipulate to all of that, okay? It is very clear that Saul wants to kill David. He needs to kill David, okay, to preserve his family lineage on the throne. And David is vividly aware of this. And actually, in one case, it says that God tells David that Saul will carry through on his threat, okay? So not only does David have a hunch that this is happening, of course, the spear going into the wall probably was a clue, okay? But he not only has a hunch, he's been told by God that that is what Saul is destined to do, wants to do. So we're, we're going to dispense with the first Samuel uh, uh, set up here, and we're going to go directly to 2 Samuel chapter 1. So just flip over a few, 2 Samuel chapter 1. After the death of, all right, I should set this up too. David has just finished massacring a horde of Amalekites. Remember that same group of people that's going to be blotted from human you know, memory? He's just finished slaughtering them, okay? Saul, meanwhile, is in, the battle, is in the valley of Jezreel, and he's fighting against the Philistines because those Samson didn't complete that, that deliverance. So we're going to start 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Saul, wow, quick. David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed at Ziklag two days. On the third day, a man with torn clothes and dust came on, came on his head, came from Saul's camp. When he came to David, he fell on the ground and paid homage. David asked him, where have you come from? He replied, I've escaped from the Israelite camp. What was the outcome? David doesn't know. Tell me. It would have been about four days, by the way, for him to get there. The troops fled from battle which means they lost, the Israelites lost. Many of the troops have fallen and are dead. Also, Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. David asked the young man who had brought him the report, how do you know Saul and that his son Jonathan are dead? I happen to be on Mount Gilboa, he replied, and there was Saul leaning on his spear. At that very moment, the chariots and the cavalry were closing in on him. When he turned around and saw me, he called out to me, and so I answered him, I am at your service. He asked me, who are you? I told him, I am an Amalekite. (laughs) Then he begged me, stand near me and kill me, for I am mortally wounded, but my life still lingers. So I stood over him and killed him because I knew after that he had fallen, he couldn't survive. I took the crown that was on his head and the armband that was on his arm. I've brought them here to you, my Lord. Get this? A sellsword, a mercenary. Okay, is he, first of all, is he telling the truth here? The answer is he is lying. He is lying. If you just go back one chapter, which, by the way, we really shouldn't have to do because this is just an artificial division of, of between First and Second Samuel. The story actually runs complete. Saul was not killed by an Amalekite. Saul was run through with archer's arrows and then fell on his sword, and his, the person that he asked to kill him was his servant that was there who would not do it, who witnessed him die, and then killed himself. That's what happened. And this Amalekite, this mercenary, comes in and says, I 
did the merciful thing here, and I'm bringing you, David, his crown, his amulet, his authority of kingship. What do you think this Amalekite is doing? Trying to ingratiate himself to David? Okay. Has anybody ever gotten themselves in a situation where you think you're being real clever, and then you go, uh-oh. Anybody done that? I saw someone last night do that, just last night, okay? Anybody familiar with this new event in rodeo called freestyle bullfighting? You're not familiar with this one? We used to call it rodeo clowning, but if you've not been to to, to one of these things, this is what the event is. You put... Spanish fighting bulls into the into the uh, the little um, uh, uh, pens, okay, and you put one idiot in the middle of the dirt, and they release the bull, and his job is to control the bull, get close enough to it without getting injured. The first idiot's probably a strong word, but I, I think it's appropriate. The first one charges at the bull and jumps over him, okay, and then begins this cat and mouse game with, oh, yeah, you're sitting with your mouth, uh, yeah, me too, okay? This is an event, a scored event in rodeo, okay? So here's the way I think about this. If I'm out there thinking, this is, I mean, there's prize money in here. Oh, this is a good idea. There's only three competing. I have a 33% chance of winning the prize. Everything's going good until that cowboy opens that chute. And now I'm thinking, I have made a terrible, possible, fatal mistake. That's exactly what happens with this Amalekite. He's thinking he's going to get a reward from David. Saul has wanted to kill him. David will ascend to the throne. I'm going to ingratiate, but I'll be getting getting riches. David will welcome this news until verse 11. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and all the men with him did the same. They mourned, they wept, they fasted until the evening for those who had died by the sword, for Saul, his son Jonathan, the Lord's people in the house of Israel. Whoops, the bull is in the pen. He thought David was going to throw a party. And David is weeping. David is mourning. And David inquired of the young man who had brought him to the, brought him the report, where are you from? I am the son of a resident alien, he said. I am an Amalekite. Bad to worse. David questioned him, how is it that you were not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? Then David summoned one of his servants and said, come here and kill him. The servant struck him and he died. For David had said to the Amalekite, your blood is on your own head because your own mouth testified against you by saying, I killed the Lord's anointed. David had every reason to be scared of Saul to rejoice. He will now ascend to the throne. His primary enemy that wanted him dead is now dead himself. And he has received his amulets, his his signs and tokens of kingship. And he does not do that because Saul was the Lord's anointed. We saw this through the, 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 the interactions with Samuel in front of the entire nation. And so David sang in verse 17, the following lament for Saul and his son Jonathan, and he ordered that the Judahites be taught the song of the bow. We won't go through it, but it is a beautiful, beautiful lament of Saul the great warrior, of Jonathan the great warrior, of the relationship between Jonathan and Saul, about the friendship between Jonathan and David. He not only memorialized him in his anguish, in his weeping, because the Lord's anointed had been cut off okay, by this Amalekite, so he thought at this point. And yet David memorialized it. Not only did he memorialize it, he made others sing it. He brought it to the entire nation. There's you another example of a memorial. 
In World War II, 400,000 Americans died, military deaths. World War I, it said 116,000 or so. Vietnam, 58,000. Korea, nearly 37,000. Revolutionary War, 25,000. The War of 1812, 20,000. Many of those needlessly because the war had already concluded. Mexican-American War, over 13,000. The War on Terror is said to have, have, have in military deaths, been over 7,000 Americans. Spanish-American War, 2,500. The Gulf War, over 200, nearing 300. The War Between the States, the Civil War, over 6, 6, 620,000, almost equal to the, the, the rest of the, the fatalities of, of, uh, of the American military involved in the foreign wars. There was a, um, uh, in the, the very popular HBO series Game of Thrones and the books by George R. R. Martin, there, there's a concept in there that's repeated quite a bit called the trial or the combat by champion. Um, a lot of people don't think that that was real, but that actually is a real thing where somebody is involved in a dispute, a legal dispute, a judicial dispute, a property rights dispute, and in the medieval uh, times, the, the, what we refer to as the Dark Ages, you could actually go and purchase yourself a champion to fight on your behalf in response to, 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 to your being aggrieved. Okay, that's how the two parties would settle disputes that couldn't be done judicially. It's even been written about as recently as the last five years in the Law Review of Yale okay, as an economic marker. But I quote from um, uh, uh, one of the history books that I have. In 1251, the abbot of Mo and the abbot of St. Mary's of York fought over who owned several profitable businesses. Although the abbots did not brawl, it was a literal fight. In accordance with English law, since the courts failed to resolve the ownership question, they chose to settle it through trial by combat. Each abbot hired a champion. There was an established market for champions, champions for rent, the best of whom had reputations that scared the other side into settling the case to fight for his claim. The bigger, better, badder ones, I guess, if you hired them, if you had enough money to hire them, uh, they, would, uh, they would scare the, uh, your, your opponent away. The people did not view this as barbaric. It was just a part of the legal process. The presiding justice in the case attended the fight, invoked the monarch's name, and followed a specific ritual that called for God to intervene and bring victory to whichever side was honest in its claim. Given the time period, the champions likely fought in a makeshift arena, but later trials by combat in England took place in special arenas that had stands for the spectators to watch. Although the abbot of Mo paid better... <laughs> His champion fought poorly. Once defeat became a possibility, representatives of the feuding abbots came to terms. Do you remember somebody else that stood in as a champion for his people? David. Was it not the massive Goliath who taunted the people of Israel? And David stood in as the champion, and with a sling and a rock... He knocked down the giant, but the job was not done. He went over, took the giant's sword, cut off his head, and won the battle. But that was an incomplete victory. The victory has been prophesied because we have a champion that has fought for us. The book of Isaiah, chapter 25 says in verse 6, The Lord of hosts will prepare a feast for all the peoples on this mountain, a feast of aged wine, choice meat, finely aged wine. On this mountain he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over the peoples, the sheet covering the nations. He will destroy death forever. Who are we referring to there? Jesus Christ. That's the prophecy. In first, in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner. Instead, share in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Skipping to verse 10, this has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, who has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, it said, the last enemy to be abolished is death. Hebrews 2, 14 
says, Now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who were once held in slavery all, the, all of their lives by the fear of death. Recall that the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, out of slavery. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, very, very familiar verses to us, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what was also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you to do this in remembrance, in memorial of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. The cup is the new covenant established by the blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Every day, every hour of every day is a memorial for us to the provision of Jesus Christ as our champion who stood in that gap, took away all sins ever prior committed, committing or will be committed, and buried them and conquered death. And he said that battle is finished. But he didn't fight for us because we paid him to be our champion. He fought for us because he loved us. And he still loves us. And he intercedes for us. He won that ultimate battle. It is over. That picture of the new Jerusalem coming down is so true that even though it has not happened yet, it is so true that it should still reside in our minds as a memory because it is as good as having already happened because God's sovereignty and his plan will not be disrupted. There's nothing left to be accomplished. <clears throat> He's coming back, okay? And the victory of all victories is confirmed through his death and his resurrection. Otherwise, we live a lie. And as the apostle says, we should just eat, drink, and be merry. Because if there is no resurrection, there is nothing. And I do hope that maybe today and tomorrow you get to eat and drink and, and, and be merry. And um, maybe even... Some homemade ice cream, is that a Memorial Day thing? I, I don't know. Should be. It should be. I'm going to find that in Scripture some, somewhere. I've, 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 you got to crank. If you crank it, it will come. That, that's, that, that's, no. Any questions, comments, announcements? Um, And it never will. It will never go away. The word will, now, whether it's carried, you know, by a nation that, that flies the stars and stripes, time will tell. I hope that we are the great eagle that the pastor talked about in the book of Revelation, but there's no guarantee of that. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us memory. We thank you that you have given us your word, that it might stimulate that memory. We thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit that protects and guards that memory. Please forgive us when we fail to memorialize what you have done for us in our lives, in our actions, in our words, in the way we carry ourselves amongst our neighbors and in our community, Lord. We pray a special blessing on the service that will follow, that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you will be also. For it's in Christ's name we pray.